Hey, I wanted to do one sort of intro video. My name is Bippy, or at least that's what uh, that's what my favorite people call me. And since you're one of my favorite people, you can call me Bippy too. Uh, I've lost 80 pounds um, and feeling pretty good about it. A lot of people have started asking me what I've been doing. So I wanted to share sort of my take on weight loss, which isn't something I've seen. I haven't seen something similar to how I've been doing it anywhere else. And <laughs> people buy me diet books like when when all your friends buy you diet books for your birthday like you know that they're worried about you <laughs> um so i'll give you a sort of a overview of my story um my family my parents met in overeaters anonymous so like i uh, i grew up in the house of eating disorders uh developed a pretty severe one myself in my teenage years um I had a trick throat. I had no gag reflex. I actually only recently developed one about a year ago when doing some of my stage three stuff, dealing with my emotional stuff. Uh, one day I just developed a gag reflex. It was really weird. My husband was very sad. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, um, my brother got involved with fencing and I started doing some high level fencing too. And he went to the Junior Olympics, and if you've ever dealt with Olympic-level athletes, then I don't think there's a single female Olympic-level athlete out there without some kind of disordered eating. I mean, the, the pressure is so intense. Um, and everybody tried to force me to eat certain ways, and I do not deal with being ordered around well. <laughs> I have issues with authority, so I... Um, I would do a lot of binging, and then I, since I have the gag reflex thing can throw up so I would just binge and then starve myself for a while which is pretty much the best way to gain weight ever if you really want to get fat <laughs> um, and um, I was pretty stable at around 200 to 220 pounds uh, got on depo Provera shot uh, if you notice every fat person has a story of how they got fat um, but I got on Depo Provera shot and I gained 60 pounds in three months and cried non-stop the entire time so um, Depo Provera I don't recommend it, um, and I know three people who've gotten pregnant while on the depot shot, so apparently it's not that hot for birth control either. So uh, if you want to get fat, cry, and get pregnant, and then get fatter and cry more, it's the way to go. So depot shot was a huge, huge nightmare for me, and uh, I did that when I was 17. Um, got the depot shot because I was in a fairly abusive relationship and did not want to be tied to this guy forever. Probably should have realized that was a sign I should dump him. But uh, with 17, 17 year old girls, mm, not always the smartest about relationships. So, um, ended up, you know, sticking with this person, even though I should have dumped their ass. And uh, when that did finally end, thank God, <laughs> um, you know, spent several years just sort of at about 220, 220 to 230. Um, and for me, that's not too fat. Um, last time I went and did the water dunk test for lean body weight, I, my, my lean mass was 175 pounds. Um, I'm probably a little bit below that now because I've been lifting as much weights, but I'm almost six foot tall. Um, my pinky ring is a size eight and a half. My wedding ring is a size nine. And, um, I don't have a lot of fat on my wrists. You can see. Um, I have to wear men's watches because my wrists are too thick to wear women's watch bands. And um, I can't buy bracelets. <laughs> so while a lot of people say, I'm big boned, um, I actually had a doctor look at one of my x-rays and say that I had the biggest bones he'd ever seen on a woman. Uh, he called them cow bones and I managed to not take offense at that. Uh, so um, for me, what is a healthy weight for me is a lot higher than it is for a lot of other women, even other women of my same height. And uh, used to be 5'11", because I've spent so many years so heavy, uh, I've shrunk a little bit. I'm now at about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, so um, I sort of puttered along, but the rapid weight gain really, really ran a number on me. And I'm pretty sure at that point I developed um, some insulin resistance issues. I mean, 60 pounds in three months, that's a lot. Um, and um, developed diabetes. And I developed type 2 diabetes and my doctor wanted to put me on meds and I said give me six months and I won't be diabetic anymore. And it took me nine and I completely reversed my diabetes. Could not get anyone interested in what I had done. 
because what I did did not focus on uh, diet. I really didn't change what I was eating and I really didn't change my exercise patterns. Um, I did a lot of supplements and I may at some point like find my old notes and find out what I'd done. Um, but you know, was, was released with a bill of good health that I had completely reversed my type two diabetes and time went on and I stayed kind of pudgy. Um, and I started working this really stressful job and was, you know, working 80 hour weeks and just kind of felt tired and down, but you know, I just started this really, really hard job. And, um, I, you know, you keep hearing if you have flu like symptoms for more than two weeks, go to the doctor. Uh, but I didn't have health insurance, so I was like, eh, well, I'm not sneezing or coughing, so I'm not contagious, I'm not getting anybody else sick, I just, I feel kind of blah, and my joints kind of hurt, and, you know, maybe it's allergies, I'm not getting a lot of sleep because of this new job, and they found me face down on my office floor. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to use the phone to dial for help. And uh, it turned out that I did not have a mild flu, apparently my pancreas is my weakest link for my earlier bout with diabetes. And I'd had a quiet little bacterial infection that killed off 80% of my pancreas. So I became a type 1 diabetic. I had a dead pancreas and had to go on insulin shots to keep myself alive. And during that time period, it got up to about... The, the highest I ever saw on a scale was 320 pounds, but I am pretty sure it was at least 340 at one point. Because um, once I started hitting the 300s, I really started avoiding scales. I didn't like scales at that point. Um, and that is basically how I got fat. Um, a lot of emotional eating, <laughs> uh, using food to deal with my problems, uh, using food as a secondary form of communication. Um, I used, you know, if, if people were sad, I would make something. You know, ice cream was my favorite sad food. If you're happy, then it was pasta. Or, or bread or some other baked good. So um, basically anytime anybody felt an emotion, my reaction was to cook. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, I, I liked large volumes of food that were inexpensive and that basically means starches. So potatoes, rice, pasta, you know, these were bread. These were all things that I absolutely love. I cook really, really well. I make amazing mashed potatoes. I make incredible pastas. Um, I make a lot of pasta by hand, uh, hand, homemade breads. These are all things that I love. And during my first round with diabetes, um, I very carefully checked what all of my reactions to foods were. I was testing my blood sugars eight to 12 times a day. Uh, my fingertips were just completely shot. <laughs> And anytime I ate wheat, I would notice that my blood sugars would stay elevated for two days, easy. Like if everything else I ate was perfect, but I had one roll with dinner or one sandwich with bread, I, you know, I was gonna have elevated blood sugars for a couple of days. So um, I just basically really liked those foods. And when I was told not to eat them, uh, I had the same reaction I did when I was 16 and surrounded by Olympic coaches who are trying to tell me what to eat, which is basically, I'm gonna eat what I want. <laughs> Don't you tell me what to do. Yeah, not my supervisor. Yeah, it was <laughs> not the most emotionally mature response. But um, every fat person has a fat story of how they got fat. Um, it's never just, oh, well, you know, I didn't pay attention and I really like food and I really like World of Warcraft and. I woke up five years later and all of a sudden, like, the fat fairy came and sprinkled fat dust all over me and I was 400 pounds. And it, it doesn't happen that way. There, there are steps along the way. Um, and uh, for me, the, the real turning point, you know, I'd, I'd sort of lost a little weight from my, from my peak. I was down to about 280 pounds. I'd lost 40 pounds just from having taken care of my emotional stuff, which is step three in the videos that I've made. Um, my dad got really, really sick, and uh, one of my friends is a doctor, and she's done a lot of work in nursing homes, and she said that you basically have two groups of people in nursing homes. You have the people around 50 to 60 years old that have been in what she calls aggressive pursuit of risk factors their whole lives. These are the people who eat like shit and smoke and drink. Um, and they don't eat like shit and smoke and drink a little. They eat like shit, drink, and smoke a lot. You know, these are the people who are drinking, you know, a six pack a day 
for years. These are the people who smoke two packs a day for years. These are the people who, you know, just, you know, um, and the phrase that I, I think of it as is suicide by fork. And for there was a while where I was doing suicide by fork. Um, you know, the way the emotional crap I was dealing with was so intense and so painful that it was the most self-destructive thing I could do, so I did it. Um, and I saw, I saw my dad in a assisted nursing facility while he was getting over this really, really horrific knee wound. Um, and they'd had to do three surgeries in two days and almost lost him and it was really horrible. Uh, and my dad's pretty young, you know, he's only 60. And the other group of people that she saw in nursing homes were the genuinely old, you know, 80 and 90 years old. And there seems to be this, this gap in between the aggressive pursuit of risk factors and the old people. And I realized that I was in the aggressive pursuit of risk factors group. I was smoking a pack a day because I hated my job. I still hate my job, um, but I have a different job that's less bad and I don't smoke anymore. I haven't had a cigarette in about two months. Um, and, you know, I, I when I was out in the smokers area at the VA nursing facility where my dad was, you know, there was type one. There were the aggressive pursuit of risk factor guys and I looked around and I realized this is what I was doing. And, you know, if it had just been myself, I would have kept doing it. But I realized this is what I was doing to my family. You know, I was setting up for my husband to have to watch me commit suicide by fork. I was setting it up so that my daughter was going to have to at a very young age deal with my, you know, me becoming an invalid, you know, um, really high uncontrolled blood sugars lead to all kinds of problems. I've, I've already got problems with my eyes because of my diabetes. Um, before round one of diabetes, I had 2020 vision and now I'm, you know, now I don't. Um, you know, I just, I realized that I was dying and I wasn't dying in the, in the, you know, we are all eventually going to shuffle off this mortal coil sort of way. I was doing it right now. Um, I tried to get into CrossFit. I was the only one in my family who could afford to go. CrossFit's kind of expensive. CrossFit is super awesome. I love CrossFit. Um, there wasn't one really close to my house. It wasn't terribly convenient and the timing was off and it was expensive. So I stopped going. Uh, we ended up getting a family gym membership for only twenty dollars a month more than CrossFit. Across, CrossFit, CrossFit. My entire family has a membership at the gym. I'm the only one who really goes, but uh, it's great. And when we do all go, there's a hot tub and a pool and babysitting and all sorts of other great stuff. So um, I started going to the gym well, every so often, whenever I felt like it, mostly to hang out at the pool. And after I went and saw my dad. Um, I had a really hard time handling it and dealing with my dad being that sick and you know it was it was so bad like I can't tell you how bad it was um, I could see that the wound was about this big and I could see all of the layers down to the bone capsule around the joint and it looked like a piece of beef um, cause I do some home butchery and it, it just, it looked like what I do when I butcher an animal and that was my father and I've always been really close to my dad. So seeing him that sick and that fucked up was, and how it was affecting my mom and my brother, um, it was a real wake up call. <laughs> you know, I had my own wake up calls and I almost died, but I always thought, you know, I bounce back. I'm gonna, you know, I'm fine. I'm tank. And my dad's always been that way, and he's not a tank anymore. It catches up with you sooner than you'd think. So, um, I started making it a real priority in my life to get healthier, and I started actually exercising more to handle um, the depression and the stress because, you know, working at a job I don't like, um, dealing with my dad being sick, with my in-laws are starting to get old and fragile, and I got a 12-year-old. Yes, I'm a working mom with ailing parents. It's sort of the classic story of our generation. I couldn't handle it. So 
that's how I got fat and how I decided to get thin. Or, you know, I really don't care about thin. I really care about healthy, so that's my story.